Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 16, where you've just sung. If you're like me, this psalm is familiar. Um, You've read it, you've sung it. Uh, You know that pouring out libations of blood is not good, even if you wonder why you're saying it occasionally. You know that your inmost self teaches you all through the night, even if you're not sure if yours does or what that means, Uh, and you know that uh, the Lord preserves you and that his Holy One he keeps from decay. So before I read it, let me take some of those words that are familiar to you and just maybe give an organizing idea to them. We're going to focus on the middle of the psalm tonight. Um, I'd like to to set this psalm in a place where uh, there are difficulties, there are troubles, there are anxieties, fears. Uh, problems that you don't see a solution to or an end to. Uh, You could see this in the life of David any number of places, although we don't know where that might be. And it doesn't take too much imagination to know when Christ might have been singing about uh, unique and insurmountable problems, the like of which the world has not seen, that there doesn't seem to be a way out of. And uh, right there, before the trouble looks like it's going away, before it looks like there's an end in sight, um, you make the confessions that you know to be true, the confessions that you know will guide you through this problem, uh, the confessions you're going to keep as you walk through it. And so you say things like, um, Daddy, help me. I'm taking refuge in you. Or preserve me, O God. I'm trusting in you. That's a defiant statement. I'm going to take my refuge in you. Uh, You make statements like, you are my Lord. I don't have any good besides you. I know what I deserve. And uh, anything that's good in me, anything that's good in the earth, any of those who have been ennobled by your grace uh, are by you. I'm not going anywhere else. Uh, The sorrows of those who chase after other gods, they only only multiply their problems. I'm not going to cause myself more trouble by going after other gods. Uh, The first vows in South Sudan uh, that we asked the church to make for membership is, do you believe in one living and true God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And the next one is, do you reject the works of the devil? So when preaching this psalm, uh, they get that. Um, We are going to have one God. We're going to trust and follow him, and that's going to exclude all others because, of course, whenever sickness or um, pain or infertility are coming. It is the clan, it is the family, it is the powers that be that come to you and say, it's good to go to church, get some prayers, keep going, but call the witch doctor, cover your bases, give them a goat, give them a chicken. Um, And there's the confession. Those who go after other gods only multiply grief. I'm not going to do that. That won't be my way through this. I'm not even going to give them a chicken, not even an egg. I'm not going to pour out the drink offerings they require. And uh, we don't offer goats and chickens, but you could think about what the gods of our world require. Tim Keller has a line at the beginning of his introduction to counterfeit gods, which says, the gods of the ancient world were bloodthirsty and hard to appease. They still are. We get to the middle of the psalm we're going to be focusing, and uh, I'd like to frame it like this taking those commitments and doing the self-work, the heart work that is necessary to begin living them out. That's what we're going to think about this evening. So as we read this, look at the commitments in the first part of the psalm, get to the second part of the psalm, and that's where we're going to focus, doing the heart work necessary to begin living out that confession. And I just want to direct your eyes to another place we're not going to spend much time at the very end, and we see that this is Christ entrusting himself to the Lord, uh, eschewing other gods, Uh, declaring that uh, all good that is in him, borne out by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the uh, loving hand of his Father, uh, we see that uh, his confidence that you're not going to allow your Holy One to see decay. And because he hasn't, because the grave couldn't hold him, it won't hold you. Uh, The the work that we're going to talk about tonight will be a victorious work in your life because in Christ, the day will come when the judge of all the earth says, I have his soul. I have her soul, now give me their body back. You don't have any right to it. And what we're going to talk about doing tonight will be done and completed in a moment, one day. 
This is the word of God. It says, preserve me, O God, I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good beside you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my portion, my inheritance, my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I'll bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I've set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made promises and you have kept every one. Have you said it? You will do it. Lord, we ask that we might make confessions, that we might speak privately to ourselves and publicly to one another about uh, how we will live, not just when things are easy, but in the midst of hardships and troubles. And Lord, we ask that as we make those confessions, you would teach us this evening how to live out that confession, to bring our lives and our beliefs in conformity with the confessions that you would have us make. Lord, we pray that we would continue this good and difficult work knowing of the victory that is sealed through the resurrection of your Son, who has overcome the grave, who has conquered sin, and who empowers us through the Holy Spirit that he said it was good for us to have. Lord, we ask that uh, you would be our teacher this evening. Take these words by the power of your spirit. Apply it to our hearts. Let us mull over them. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would teach us to fight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So how do we live the commitment? We've read some of the commitments in the first part of the psalm. The difficulty is making the confession is a very good first step. Living it out is another issue altogether. So what do we do in church? As we should, we stand, we sing, we make great confessions. We publicly make solemn oaths to the Lord and to one another. This is what we do when we sing psalms, right? We say these incredible things to one another, and hopefully we mean them. We speak of present blessing. The lot has fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a good inheritance. And we speak of future joy in your presence, our pleasures forevermore. And then we get in the car that costs too much and that's wearing out quickly. And we drive with our family who doesn't give us very much personal space and who ties us down to a house that is falling apart and needs repair. And we don't want to bother with that. And we get in the door and we trip over shoes that... I guess we haven't told people to pick up enough times. And we go to our sink that's piled with dishes. And once again, someone has left the knife with giant globs of peanut butter unscraped on and hoping that it'll dissolve in the water, right? There's a pile of laundry on the table. I haven't seen the table in a couple years. And no one can bother to unfold the socks, which means that when you do unfold them, all that newly washed dirt and grass that your children left in there for you will fall over top of that laundry. Wet towels on the floor, bills on the counter, reminding us that we're not likely to get ahead for some time unless some rich unknown family member dies, and that sounds horrible to say, but, you know, it's a solution. And we got home for dinner Friday, but we had to leave a lot of business unfinished, and it's hanging over our heads all weekend, so we don't feel like we're really getting much of a break. And our Sabbath day ends knowing that we're going to start the week behind. And while there's more work to do than we feel like we'll ever get done, we just turn on the TV so we can watch a life that we seem sure other people have and we never will. And maybe we overdid that a little bit. Maybe not. 
Maybe that's the way it feels when we leave church sometimes. Maybe we get back to life and uh, all those things we said have a hard time sinking in and sticking. Uh, The attitudes we walk out of church with don't last nearly as long as they need to. And we see a hard distinction between the things we confess and the contentment and the attitudes that we approach life with. But if we believed what we confessed, wouldn't we think about life differently? If we believed what we confessed, wouldn't we approach that same set of circumstances with a completely different set of adjectives? Uh, If we believed what we confessed, wouldn't we live differently? But instead we say things like, of course that happened. I can't catch a break. Can't you give me a break? I don't need this. I don't need this. Uh, Or whatever you say. And these are the attitudes and the self-talk. But these aren't the attitudes and the self-talk that we should have if we really believed that we deserve nothing, that apart from you, I have no good, that the wages of sin is death, that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith and that of yourselves. If we believed in the sovereignty of a God who works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, if these were the paths of reality, the paths of truth that we let our thoughts interpret the world around us with, would we approach life differently? And that's the question we want to ask this evening as we think about living a commitment and trying to implement that commitment in our hearts and live that out. So, living the commitment with contentment. Uh, look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, The Lord is my, the portion of my cup. It doesn't say that. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance in my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. On the day that I married Melissa, August 9th of 2003, um, uh, what was the day before August 9th? August 8th, 2003, we had made plans. We had picked out colors and flowers and invitations and cakes and table decor and favors and all of the other indispensable trappings of an American wedding. Um, And uh, that evening, as we are printing off um, our bulletins, because we loved to save money even back then, and I had gone to Best Buy, and I'd bought a new ink cartridge, but I'd bought the photo cartridge instead of the the regular red, blue, and green or whatever. And uh, so as the bulletins start getting printed out, Uh, It's not in the proper colors. It's all washed out and pastel. Um, And Melissa started to cry, which doesn't happen often. It's like Sasquatch sightings. (laughs) But a wonderful thing happened right then because we committed, and I I, I don't even feel like I'm embellishing this story. We committed right then uh, that we'd done all we could. We'd planned. we'd, We'd made all the arrangements possible. And if everything went wrong the next day and we got married, we would call that a glaring success. If we walked away from that day and had the chosen one in whom our hearts delighted and the beta fish centerpieces died and the cake fell uh, and the DJ didn't show and the friends didn't come and we had our portion, it would be enough. It'd be more than enough. It would be something to delight in. And... um, So when a cousin threw a football and landed in the middle of the wedding cake just before the reception, no one cried. (laughs) It was a good day. And in this psalm, we just sang that the Lord is my chosen portion, um, my chosen one in whom my heart delights, to quote from a different place. So just to think back about what we already looked at in verses 1 to 5, you know, difficult things are happening Confessions are being made uh, with audacity, with defiance, uh, against what everything looks like. Dangers come threatening health, well-being, positions, wealth, power, respect, dignity. And the commitment of David in this psalm, the commitment that he makes as a picture of Jesus, is that God is his portion. He's all he wants. He's all he needs. All this other stuff, it's just that. It's stuff. And if we gain the world and lose our soul, it benefits us nothing. But if we lose it all and we count it all rubbish for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, 
in him glorified and find in him a righteousness not of our own, but one that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, we gain the world. And we find ourselves at that moment and for all of eternity, the last who have become first. The Lord is my portion. And so you've been there. You've, you've been in difficult trials. You've been in the midst of pain that doesn't look like it's ever going to go away, that you're going to have to live with. You make confessions. You disavow any other God. You say that the Lord has been good to me. He's not dealt with me as I deserved. We commit ourselves to interpreting reality with the unchanging truth of heaven. We remind ourselves that he's not dealt with us as we deserved, but he's given us much more than we have a right to, much more than we could ask, much more than we could ever demand. He's blessed us beyond what we could even ask for or imagine. But maybe uh, that's not the way you're feeling this evening. Uh, maybe that's not the way you feel very often. And it's true, finding people who are willing to talk like this or you know, as rare as gold nuggets, right? And finding people who live like this, I'm running out of metaphors, as rare as hen's teeth. But contentment doesn't come from comparing our situation and the relative ease or goodness or badness of others, although we might well gain some perspective by looking at the lives of others and realizing how the Lord has blessed us. But contentment comes from focusing on truth, focusing on all that the Lord has done, not only for you, but for others. Not only recently, but throughout history, giving us Christ, watching over and providing for us, remembering all that we deserve, remembering all that we have is by grace. Looking around and focusing on what is true, what is honorable, what is of good repute, and finding at the end of that honest assessment that we have been dealt with well, And that's not usually a commitment we come to easily. It's a commitment we have to fight for, despite its obvious truth. Remembering that the Lord has brought into our lives what we needed, what was best for us, and then staring that difficult truth in the eye and reckoning with it. Whether it's abuse, disability, discrimination, or old wallpaper. Verse 7, he says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Here David is guided uh, by the Lord's word, by his hand of providence. The Lord gives him counsel. The Lord instructs him. He has set the Lord and the reality of the Lord and who he is and what he does before him. He interprets the world around him through that lens. But what do we do with our memories? What do we do with our anxieties and fears? What do we do with our pain? Rather than looking at them through Christ, we like to work them over, don't we? We like to really chew on them. David's here feeling rather cut off from the Lord, I think. He's feeling cut off from wise counsel. And he's devising ways of escape, but he's not seeing any. And this whole of this passage is a state that we can relate to or we should be able to relate to. One that you've experienced, but also one that you need to fight against. We're not alone. No temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. And the Lord will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. But when we're left alone with our thoughts, we get in our own heads, don't we? We psych ourselves out. We play over the problems. We relive the pain. We play out the worst case scenarios to cause the most possible pain and we marinate in hopelessness. We convince ourselves of outcomes and inevitabilities that are neither as bad or as inevitable in reality as they are in our heads. And then we do it again and again and again. Like that ulcer you get in your mouth that hurts and you can hardly eat, but you keep sticking your tongue in it and making it hurt more. And occasionally you think, this is stupid. Why do I keep doing this? But then you do it again a moment later, 
And no matter how many times you have that thought, it's like you're addicted to that pain somehow. It's like that pain has somehow become something meaningful to you. We need others to speak truth to us. We need the word of God. We need a meditation upon the attributes of God, his praises. We need that song to be sung over and over again so we can't get that out of our heads. But this takes work. It takes a lot of work. And it takes the spiritual fruit of self-control. This takes putting off unprofitable thinking, unhealthy thoughts, and unhealthy patterns of thought. Patterns are hard to break. Habits are hard to break. Especially ones we've come to kind of get addicted to. So we need to stop rehearsing the same old hurts. We need to stop going over and over them and recounting our losses until you're half out of your mind. Stop reliving the moments and the seasons of loss. Quit being your own prophet of doom. I don't mean think happy thoughts. In fact, a lot of profitable thoughts are going to be painful. They're going to be difficult. I don't mean living in denial or hoping to simply run away from or pretend that there are no problems. I don't mean pursuing distraction and lying to yourself until you rewrite your own history. I mean think profitable thoughts. Think true thoughts. Some of those will be ugly at first. Many profitable thoughts are difficult to get rid of and will be painful because we're addicted to judging our self-worth. We're addicted to excusing our behavior with that pain. Uh, But when we're thinking about our sin, when we're thinking about the responsibility for the evil in our own lives or our responses to the evil in our own lives, when we're thinking of our responsibility before God, of his faithfulness to act, his promise to do good, his promise to work all things together for good, and that he has worked all things together for good that got you to this difficult place, and he's going to work all things together for good to get you out of this difficult place. His path's faithfulness to send Jesus once with reference to sin and again for judgment. You think those thoughts, and you are not magically going to feel better a moment later, but you will be stepping off of the spiraling elevator of doom and stepping onto the shore and eternal person of the God of heaven and earth. God of the universe, you will be setting your mind on the loving Father, on the suffering and rising and reigning Son, on the powerful and empowering and sanctifying Holy Spirit. And you will continue to ask, how long, O Lord, will my enemies be lifted up over me? But you'll be asking the Lord in faith, how long and not if. We need to make the counsel in our own minds the truth of the promises of God. We need to make the counsel of our own minds the truth of the promises of God. Just look at those verses again. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I've set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I was in seminary, and I I leaned over to... um, the man next to me, an upperclassman, I said, what on earth does that mean? Uh, and he goes, he gave me an answer, which I think was true, but it was wholly unsatisfying as to why I'm singing about that. It was probably a good answer. I just didn't understand what he was saying. We need to make the counsel in our own minds the truth of the promises of God. We need to bring godly counsel into our weekly experience. We need to make a rehearsing not of the pain and the loss, but of the promises of God, the meditation of our hearts. We need to make the song of salvation our summer anthem. We need to get ourselves to the point where our sleep is not filled with a rehashing of the nightmares, of the day's troubles, and of past hurts. Have you ever said to anyone, I try to go to sleep and my mind just runs and I don't sleep much anymore? We need to make get ourselves to the point where our our nightmares are not filled with the day's troubles and past pain, but to the point where our dreams are filled with an unconscious processing of the promises of God. So we can sing like we just did, 
my inmost self teaches me all through the night. You see, when the day is spent setting aside unprofitable thoughts and meditating on the promises of God for hope and the law of God for instruction and wisdom, when the days are spent praying for wisdom to the one who gives graciously, the result is that giant mainframe sitting on your shoulders that can outthink Google's supercomputers is able to take all of that conscious daily processing, that hard work of putting off and putting on, and in a less objective way, continue that work in the night. And so here is the Lord, and here is the promise that the Holy Spirit guides you not only in your daily fight to think profitable thoughts and do that work of bringing your life and your attitudes into conformity with your confession, but even in the night he instructs, not necessarily in dreams and visions, but in instruction, in wisdom, in perspective, My inmost self teaches me, even in the night. What does a meditation on your current circumstances bring about in you? What does processing what's going on in your life bring about in you? What does it evoke? Confidence in the future or depression and despair? And if we're honest, the answer is probably yes. Um, So now we've got work to do. When we can say to the Lord... The borders, the lines, the lot you've given me, the inheritance I have, it's good. What I have right now is much more than I deserve, much more than I can ask for, much more blessed than I could ever hope if I'm being honest with myself. Then you find that your contentment backs up your confession and your attitude begins to allow you to approach life along the lines of those confessions you've made to one another and to the Lord. It's not about what the Lord has brought into your life or what he's allowed you to experience. It's about whether you've sang that first line, preserve me, O God, I'm taking refuge in you. Have you taken refuge in him? Are you actively, currently, and continually taking refuge in him? For salvation, yes, and for life. Taking all your anxieties and casting them upon the Lord. And we certainly don't mean that there won't be hard times or that there won't be excruciating times, but that when we do this work to bring our lives into conformity with our confessions, we get to finish the psalm. We're not going to talk about the rest of the psalm, but listen to the way it finishes. I've set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I won't be shaken. This isn't pride. This isn't presumption. This isn't a... uh, a rosy forecast based on uh, current trending events. Uh, This is a a commitment and a confession of statement of faith. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we, uh, we confess to you this evening that our mind runs when we lay down to sleep because we don't trust that you're taking care of it. Uh, Lord, we confess that our uh, minds are filled not with a continual setting before ourselves of you and your promises and your goodness, but with a constant drumbeat of our losses and our failures, and our embarrassments, and our bitterness, and our indignity. And Lord, we ask that you would allow us to see that for what it is. And we pray, Lord, that you would allow us to see that it's killing us. And we pray, Lord, that you would allow us to see that Jesus told us to give our burdens to him, and to take his yoke, the yoke of his promises, the yoke of his righteousness, a yoke freely given that is light, and easy. Lord, we ask that we might cast all our anxieties upon you, and we ask, Lord, that we would do that by believing what we say is true. Father, we pray that our confessions would be true, and that we would have the strength to make those confessions long before we see an end. And Lord, we ask that by your grace and by the power of your Spirit and through our union with Christ, the power that rose him, brought him from the grave, 
would be at work in us, allowing us to bring our lives and do the hard work, the mental work, the spiritual work of bringing our lives and attitudes into conformity with that confession. We pray this now in Christ's name. Amen.